All right, Judges. So Judges, we've talked about this. This is the book. After they've entered into the land, they've settled in the land. And unfortunately, they didn't heed all the counsel that God gave them in Deuteronomy and in Joshua. Unfortunately, they didn't listen to the warning of all the idolatry that would be surrounding them, of a world that would try to draw them away from God. They were told to wipe out the enemies, not become like them. But Judges, as we've talked about, it's amazing because like Leviticus takes place in one month. All Leviticus is one month. Judges is 400 years. And during that 400 year period, we talked about this, seven cycles, and I'll go into detail what those cycles were again, where they have a deliverer, they walk, you know, the deliverer dies, they walk away from God, they're enslaved, and they cry out to God, and he brings another deliverer, and they just keep repeating that thing for, that cycle for 400 years. Now, catching us up to where we are, last week we began to look at a man by the name of Gideon, and when you think of Gideon, you think of uh, Gideon's mighty men or Gideon's mighty army, but we know that last week we saw that Gideon was a man who began with great doubt. You guys remember that? And when God commanded him, he, oh man, I can't do it. And then it went from I can't do it to, uh, uh, you know, and he starts basically asking questions of God. He doesn't actually ask the questions, but in his actions, and his behavior, the four questions we saw last week, oh, I grabbed the wrong one. The four questions we saw in last week's text was first, does God really care about us? Have any of you ever thought that before? God bless you, Dina. See, she's very, very honest in the front row. I like that. You have moments where, does God care about me? Does God care about my circumstances? Does God know what's going on in my life? And that was kind of how Gideon felt. Uh, and we saw that he does care. He cares enough to discipline us. He cares enough to give us his word. And he cares, us, cares enough to come down and speak to us personally. Amen? Through the word of God, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Uh, the second one that, man, this is blasphemous to even ask it, but does God know what he's doing? And I think that's a question the world always has. Well, if God is real, then why does this happen? And why are there, why are there wicked people? And why is there death in the world? And why is there, and we want to question God. God knows exactly what he's doing. And guys, any evil in this world is not God's fault. It's man's fault. Amen. Say amen to that. Amen. It's only by the grace of God there's any good. Because all good comes from him. Amen. And then we saw him. Is concerned, will God take care of me? And a lot of times, the reason we hold back and we don't step out in faith, we're afraid in our flesh, we're afraid that if I step out, if I let go of my security blanket, what's going to happen? And you know what? That's just not trusting God's promises. He's Jehovah Jireh, Lord God, our provider. Can we say amen to that? And if you think if you step out in faith, God's going to leave you hanging out there? Absolutely not. And then we saw it as God keep his promises. Remember, we talked about, and, and other pastors would disagree with me on this, and that's okay. It's not an essential. But I, do, I really believe that Gideon was a very faithless man early on. Because even putting out the fleeces to me is faithless. Because if God tells you to do something, you don't have to test him to make sure that what he tells you is right. Amen? Well, if God really wants me to obey his word, then I, there should be a rainbow in my backyard right now. Go. And we kind of put God to the test. Guys, we don't need to test God. We need to trust God. Amen? And trust what his word says. So we saw him go from doubter, and we're going to see some more about Gideon this morning, or this morning, this evening. And uh, you can tell I've had a long day. But uh, I titled the message, if you have your outline, we'll, we'll look at that in just a moment. We'll give a little background. I titled it Small Enough for God to Use. Small Enough for God to Use. You know, too often in the church today, I hear people say like, things like this. If so-and-so would just get saved, can you imagine? You know, if, if that personality would get saved, if those people would get saved, if that famous person, if that actor, if that athlete would get saved, if that rich person would get saved, can you imagine? You know what? God doesn't need us. We need him. And God is not, uh, you know, blown away by Bill Gates' wealth. And he's not blown away by any actor's talent or any, uh, you know, athlete's ability. And, and guys, we, we're in this mentality that, man, if this person would get saved, what would God do? Again, God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And it's those that, are, that walk in humility that tend to be used the, in the greatest way by God. Can we say amen to that? And, and you know what? And God should get all the credit. Can we say amen to that? And too often, you know, even when you see people that get saved, uh, and maybe they are famous and they get saved, well, I think of Bob Dylan. 
You guys remember when Bob Dylan got saved? For a little while? Put out a couple albums? And the problem is, when someone like that gets saved, too often they throw him in the limelight almost immediately. And he's still an infant in his faith if he was even saved at all. Amen? And so there's this mentality that we think God needs gifted people, he needs big personalities, he needs you know, the right location, he needs a new program. No, you know what he needs? He just needs simple men and women who are willing to say, here I am, Lord, use me. Amen? And those who are desperate for God. If we think the key to reaching the world with the gospel is more powerful and influ influential people on God's side, we've completely missed it. Think about when he called the apostles. Did he call the most eloquent speakers? Did he call the most gifted people? A lot of the people he called were hated. Think of Matthew, right? The tax collector. You know, he called fishermen. Fishermen were not typically real educated guys. He, he got guys who were rough around the edges. So then when God did great things, God would get the glory, not the eloquent man. Amen? Or the gifted person. And so we're going to see more of that tonight. That the answer isn't more powerful, influential, and charismatic men or women, but more broken, desperate, and spirit-filled men and women. That's what God's looking for. The eyes of the Lord search to and fro among the whole earth, seeking one who can show himself strong on account of one whose heart is loyal to him. And again, while we do have an active part in God's perfect will, not only for our own lives, but for those around us, those who, who we're called to minister to, but contrary to what the world would believe, true success is not based on our own fortitude, unction, boldness, strength, or positive mental attitude. We always think that, well, that guy's so positive, he's going to be used in such a mighty way because he's so positive. And I'm going to pull myself up on my Duke brute straps, and I'm going to go out and take the world for the Lord. Okay. Hey, step out in faith, but be desperate for God. Amen? I've shared this illustration with you before. It's just tragic. Uh, when I was in San Jose, this was probably 15 years ago, 20 years ago maybe, we had, we'd have these guys come in to do sales meetings that were motivational speakers. And we had this guy come in, and he was an old guy, and he was crude as the day is long. And he said the way that he kept himself positive all the time is he would get up in the morning and look in the mirror. If you've been here a while, you've heard me tell this before. And here's what he'd say to himself 50 times every morning. I sizzle with power and enthusiasm. <laughs> and he said, I say it 50 times to myself in the mirror. And then he wanted everybody to stand up and say the same thing. And I'm listening to him, he's crude, he was foul-mouthed, he was belligerent, and I leaned over to a buddy of mine who's a Christian and I said, if this brother don't get saved, he's gonna be sizzling. <laughs> and there ain't gonna be no power and no enthusiasm when he's there. But we need to pray for his salvation right now, amen? But we live in a world today that thinks it's, I need a, I need a more positive attitude and I need a more, I need more unction, I need more, you know, it's me. Guys, it's less of us. I don't want more of me, I want less of me, amen? So, small enough to be used by God. We're gonna see more lessons from the life of Gideon, learning to live by faith. For point number one is God's gonna, God tests our faith. He loves us enough to take away the, re the resources for us that we need to trust in ourselves. You know, a lot of times, let's be transparent. Are we more at peace if there's more than enough money in the bank? Can we say amen to that? Yeah. Are we more at peace if at the moment our health is close to perfect? I'm not really sick. I get, don't we feel, right, better? Oh, my health's pretty good. And, you know, don't we feel better when we've got a, a, a good job? Amen? I got a good job. I got money in the bank. I got my health. And we could lose all of those in about five seconds. And if you put your faith in anything that can be lost... It won't be long before it is. Guys, the good news is they can take away my bank account, I could lose my job tomorrow, and they can, they, di they can diagnose me with a terminal illness all in the same day, and my relationship with God won't change. My eternity won't change. My faith will hopefully do nothing but get increased. Can we say amen to that? And so the Lord loves us enough, sometimes like, why is God let me go through this? If he loved me, why would he let me go? He lets you go through it because he loves you. Amen? Uh, there was no, there wasn't an amen in the building on that one. <laughs> God allows us to go through trials because he loves us. Can we hear an amen? amen? 
Faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And it's the, it's the trying of our faith that molds us more into the image of our Savior. So we're going to first see that God tests our faith. Number two, He doesn't just test it, though. He encourages our faith. You know, when you step out in faith, God shows up. Amen? When you take a leap of faith, when you get out of your comfort zone and think about the times where you've grown the most in your life, more than likely, it's one or two of these things at the same time. Either you've gone through a great trial and you've grown a great deal, or you've gotten out of your comfort zone and you've allowed God to show up in a mighty way and you've grown a great deal. Amen? But yeah, we want to grow, but we want to stay comfortable. And we don't want to lose our stuff. And we don't want to go through any difficulty. And I don't want to step out of my comfort. Let someone else do it. And it's one thing to say, God, use me. And it's another thing to show up. Amen? We used to go door-to-door witnessing in Santa Cruz. We used to have groups. We'd have 45 people sign up. And then the day we'd go out, there'd be four people show up. A lot easier to sign up than it is to show up. Amen? It's one thing to say, I'm sold out for you, Lord. It's another thing to live like it. Because it doesn't come from our unction or our enthusiasm. It comes, and by the way, I've said this many times, in theos, the word enthusiasm means filled with God. So you can't have enthusiasm if you don't have the Holy Spirit. Amen? You can have phony Want to be enthusiasm, but true in theos, filled with God, only comes from the Lord. And then finally, not only does he test our faith and encourage our faith, but he honors and blesses our faith. God's going to give Gideon wisdom and courage, and in the end, a fruitful victory. We're going to see that he's going to go from this man again of doubt to a man of courage. And then, and then we'll see, sadly, next week, that he's going to be a man of compromise. And even with all that being said, he's in God's hall of faith. And doesn't that encourage you? Because it encourages me. Amen? Because when you look in Hebrews 11, you look at the names of all the people, you start reading them, and you're like, oh, but you go back and read their whole story, not so much all of them. And that encourages me, because that means that he can use people like us. Gideon's name is listed in the God's hall of faith, and yet in close examination of his life, he appears to be anything but a warrior as his name is defined or a mighty man of valor as God described him. Praise God for his grace. He was a man who started off somewhat of a faithless coward, hiding from the enemy, doubting God's word, asking God to prove his promises. One who had to see and then he would believe. Uh, so he was faithless. And yet the Lord called him a mighty man of valor because as we said last week, God sees our finished product. He doesn't see us now he sees the people we're going to become, and aren't you glad? He who began a good work is faithful to complete it. And my prayer for all of us is we would continue to grow. So let's begin there. Small enough to be used by God, learning to live by faith. God has just given them a victory, and now they're going to face an even greater obstacle, an even greater army to face. And God's going to make sure that he brings them to the end of himself. Look what it says there in verse uh, one of Judges chapter 7. And it says there, interestingly enough, quick question for who was paying attention last week, then Jurabel, Jurabel, Baal, or Baal. Who is that? Gideon. It's Gideon. And remember who gave him that name? Bonus points. Who gave him that name last week? What's that? The men of the city. The men of the city? His father. You know what's awesome? Is remember that last week, we do see him obey God when God told him, okay, you're manif- oh, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go into your father's house and I want you to knock down all the idols. And then I want you to take two of his, his, his calves, his cattle, and I want you to sacrifice them to the Lord. And that would be like saying, here's what I want you to do. I want you to burn your father's backyard to the ground, then I want you to total both his cars. Because the animals were of great value, and they had this belief in the false gods, and instead of his dad being angry, Gideon's faith stirred his father up to where his father began to defend him and called him by this name, as the men of the city did. Now, some meant it to be derogatory. Uh, derogable, again, it, it literally means, I wrote it down here, it means uh, uh, one who fights against Baal. That's a great name. Amen? 
Remember Baal is the you know, false god, the god of rain, also the god of fertility, false god they sacrifice their children to. Horrible. One who fights Baal. That'd be like if you had a child today and you named him one who fights abortion. Amen? One who fights uh, false gods. One who fights what, uh, you know, the, the things of this world. And so he's got a new name. But now he also needs to continue to live up to it. The name given to Gideon by his father after he had torn down the altar of Baal and cut down the wooden image that was beside it, used wood to make fire to sacrifice the bull and the, the young calf in his, that he had in his household to the true and living God. The men of the city wanted to kill Gideon for obeying God's command. By the way, when you stand up for God, it doesn't mean that everybody's going to celebrate that with you. Amen? You will have people that will encourage you and stand with you, and you will have others that will attack you for standing up for the things of God. And you know what my prayer is always? Lord, give me the boldness to not worry about what men think one bit. Amen? Amen? Why is it we won't share our faith more? Because we're afraid of what men think. Why is it we won't step out in faith? Because we don't want to be uncomfortable in front of men. Guys, if we only think about God, that won't even be an issue. Amen? Well, he has stepped out, and he is learning, and he is growing, and he did obey God, and he did this thing that's bringing about opposition. So Gideon's bold, obedient act impacted his father, though his altar, idols, and bull, bulls, and, and then remember what his father said, they, were going, they wanted to go after his son, he goes, let Baal defend himself. His dad got some wisdom, didn't he? He's like, hey, attack Baal. If Baal's a god, Baal can get him. Let Baal do it. Amen? Bring your wooden gods. Let's see how that works out. Often God says that in his word. You know, call on the gods you worship on the day of judgment. See how that works out for you. The next time you're going through a trial and you need, you need help, call out to your wooden gods and see what they can do. It says there, then Jerob Baal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the well of Harad, so that the camp of the Midianites was on the north side of them by the hill of Morah in the valley. The well of Herod, if you've ever been to Israel, it's now called Gideon Springs. I've been there. I was actually trying to find some pictures from when I've been there to show you. But Gideon Springs, uh, water comes right out of a rock. That's spiritual significance, amen. Who's the rock? Jesus. Water, rest in the word, you know, living water, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God. Washing by the water, the Word of God. And so they're, they're mounting up. They're up on top of a hill, they're looking down into the valley at the Midianites. Now remember, the Midianites are the same people that have now put them in a place of bondage. And if you'll remember, because of their disobedience to God, God gave the Midianites power over them. And what would the Midianites do every year at harvest time? They come and take all the food they had grown all year long. And if you remember when we saw Gideon in the beginning, he was hiding in a wine press. You remember that? Because he was trying to, you know, sift, you know, the food, get rid of the chaff. You usually do that on a threshing floor, which is up really high where it's windy. He was doing it in secret so he could hold on to some of the food. So now these are the people that have been oppressing them for seven years. Gideon, believe it or not, when they cried out to God, this is the guy. This is the deliverer. Wait till we get to Samson. This is the guy. This is the guy representing God. The fearful. The doubter. Well, make, 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 make it wet just on the, okay, make everything else wet. You know, testing God. That's the best they got. This is the guy. God's going to use him. So he has been faithful to this point. Now they're all gathered together, and God's going to test his faith even more. So Gideon Springs is still there, by the way. It's nowhere near um, as deep or as large as it once was. But if you go to Gideon Springs, you can go there and you can drink water right out of it. And the word harad means trembling or terrified. So they're at the well of the terrified. And they're about to be. Because if they're going to look from a physical perspective, they're going to look down on this mighty army of the Midianites, and we're going to see that they're hugely outnumbered. Ever feel like you're outnumbered as a Christian? 
Do you ever feel like you're the only, maybe the only believer in your family, you're around a table, you're the only believer in your office, in your workplace, or in the school, or wherever you may be, and you feel like you're outnumbered? And see, I'll be honest with you, I love that. And the reason that I do, because people have said to me, you know, I've had, you know, since I've been here, I've had people say, would you be interested in coming and taking this church here or this church here? I'm like, why would I want to go to a place where I already got 50 other churches when I can be in a place where there's no other churches? Don't we want to be in the darkest place around? Amen. Amen? Where do you think the flashlight's most appreciated? Amen. Let's bring it to the people that need it the most. And so they're going to be in a situation where it's kind of overwhelming. And they're going to put their faith is going to be put to the test. And they're going to have to make a stand for God because they're going to be outnumbered. And guess what? There's nothing new under the sun. So it's been a time of rest and refreshment. You know, they're, in a, they're surrounded a beautiful well in a, you know, a desert place. Water coming up right out of the rock, right out of the ground. It's crystal clear. It's the most beautiful, clear water I've ever seen. And it says they're the camp of the Midianites. Uh, we're going to see there's 135,000 Midianites. They had been God's chosen tool of righteous judgment. They're cousins of the Israelites through Keturah, uh, uh, through Adam, or Abraham, excuse me, and through Keturah. Uh, Six sons sent away to keep them from harassing Isaac. Israel was bound and oppressed by Midian for seven years. They came in and took all the fruit of their harvest. And now they're in this place looking down, getting the first real glimpse of their opposition. See, when you got 32,000 soldiers, many of them are very brave until they see 135,000 in the opposition. I'm ready to fight. Who am I fighting? Pee Wee Herman, I'm down. Let's do it. I'm ready to fight. Who is it? Mike Tyson. I got a cold. I don't feel good. I'm going home. Well, this is what's going to happen. They're going to look down, and they're going to see 135,000. They're armed up. They've got camels. They're outmatched. They're huge in number. They're standing up on top of the hill. It's kind of like when they walked around Jericho. Remember the Lord had them walk around Jericho for seven days? Why did he do that? He wanted them to see that the obstacle was overwhelming and there was no way in their own strength can they win. So when the, God brought the victory, God got the glory. Amen? Now the same thing is happening to Midian. They're looking down the valley and they see the size of the army and people are starting to go, I don't I was kind of fired up. I signed up. I'm not sure I want to show up. Amen? 45 people signed up, four people show up. And the same thing's happening here as many of them come and they see the size of the enemy and they start to be overwhelmed. A faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. Amen? I can say I have faith all day long. Don't tell me, God might say to us, show me. Amen? Real faith is proved in actions. Real faith is seen we're in the difficulties of life. Notice it says out the hill of Mora or Moray. It's the hill located in the Jezreel Valley in the plain of Megiddo. This, as they're looking down into the valley, what they're looking at is Megiddo, where we get the word Har Megiddo, which, where we get the term Armageddon. And it's where the last battle is going to take place when we return with the Lord. So this is the place and they're looking down on this perfect battlefield and they see 135,000 soldiers who are armed up and they've got camels for transportation and they're outnumbered. So this is how it starts. And they've got 32,000 guys. Now watch what happens. And the Lord said to Gideon, the people you are, who are with you are too many. Well, wait a minute. To what? You say too few? Yeah, I agree. Yes, Lord. No, they're too many. We're outnumbered three and a half to one right now. Four to one. Four guys, each one of my guys has to kill four people. We're outnumbered. And the Lord says, there are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands, lest Israel claim glory for itself against me, saying, my own hand has saved me. So we're already outnumbered four to one, and the Lord tells them, you know what? If you go down there and win the battle, outnumbered four to one, you're just going to think you're a bunch of studs. Yeah, that Mike Tyson came by, and I showed him. You know, there was a big army, but, you know, we're bad dudes. Look at us. And what happens is we can fall into the trap of thinking somehow we did it. Touch not the glory. Amen? 
It's all, anything good comes from God. When people will compliment me on, that was a good message, I always say, no, well, praise God. And people will say, well, you can receive that. No, I'm not going to, because if it was a good message, it was God. If it's a bad message, that was me. <laughs> can we say amen to that? Whatever gift you have, God gets the glory, not you. Amen? Well, I'm using this gift God gave me, and I'm being inconvenienced, and I'm not being appreciated. I hope that's not why you're doing it. You're doing it for the Lord, not to be praised by the world. Amen? So God tells them, look, I don't want you to claim the glory. He's, they, they've seen they're outmanned. The Lord says, you've got too many guys. Some of Israel, no doubt, already feeling faint. Are you crazy? There's not too many of us. The Lord goes on to explain again that lest Israel claim the glory, though outnumbered, an army of 32,000 was still too large as Israel could take credit for the victory. Israel and the soldiers themselves could attribute their victory to their own great bravery and strategy. Man is prideful and loves to think it's something he's done. Guys, to God be all the glory always. Amen? Amen? And you know what? Someone who gives God the glory is a man that God, or woman that God will use. So God wanted the odds to be so bad that no man could take the credit. God wanted them to be in a position where it was so desperate that there was no other hope, there was no other place to go, there was no doctor to cure it, there was no amount of money that could fix it, there was no other answer, so they'd have to cry out to God. And then when God brought the victory, they could give glory to no one but Him. And so when you're going through trials of life, sometimes God's putting you in a Gideon spot. And he's saying, let me just show you that I'm the only answer you have. I'm the only source of true hope in the midst of the difficulty of your life. Gideon and Israel are going to have to reduce their army. The Bible says, not by might nor by power, but by the spirit. my spirit, says the Lord. Guys, if our bank account's reduced, if we lose our job, if we're in failing health, being brought to the end of our resources, our ability to get the job done forces us to trust and cry out to God. Be honest, when have you cried out to God with the greatest amount of desperation? When has that happened? When you're in the most desperate place. None of my sons are in there, and I don't think they're watching. I can tell you without, it's not even close. The times I've cried out to God at the end of myself is when my son overdosed and I'm doing CPR on him in my kitchen and he's turning blue and he's not waking up. Another son went missing from rehab. Nobody could find him. I was laying on my face down, please God, just crying out. And I had to go down to LA, try to find my son in a city of 10 million people and I got off on the 10 freeway, I'm not sure, and I got off the freeway and on the off-ramp at three o'clock in the morning holding up a sign, begging for money, panhandling was my son. God answers desperate prayer. Amen? And you know what? Every time I go through that, my prayer is, Lord, I pray I don't have to get there to be that desperate for you. Amen? I, let me just stay desperate all the time. Amen? But if we don't, God loves us enough to get us there. And people say, I only pray when I'm going through a tough time. I've been going through a lot of tough times lately. He misses you. <laughs> Haven't seen him in a while. Take his job. <laughs> Lord, help. <laughs> Lord loves us enough to allow us to go through trials. God tests our faith. Faith that hasn't been tested is a faith that cannot be trusted. When the victory comes and we're outnumbered, God gets the glory. Verse 3. And it says there, And the Lord said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give to the Midianites in their hands, lest Israel claim, again, verse 2, itself to me, my hand, my own hand has saved me. I don't want you to fall into that trap. Now, therefore, proclaim in the hearing of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and afraid, let him turn and depart at once from Mount Gilead. So he gets up in front of the 32,000 guys, lets them all look down. They see an army of 135,000, more armed than us, better trained than us. We don't have weapons like them. They've got camels to move fast. And he turns around and says, whoever wants to go home can go home. And look what happens. And 22,000 of the people returned and 10,000 remained. 
You were outnumbered four to one. And 22,000 guys got up and left. They signed up, but they weren't ready to show up. Amen? And here they are. We're out. Can you imagine the 10,000 that stayed as guys are walking by? Dude, where are you going, man? What are you doing? Why are you leaving? And too often, we can be influenced by, the, influenced by those who leave instead of staying where God has called us to be. Amen? Hey, I've been a part of five church plants. This has been the toughest one. It just has. Because it's the city that we're in. Um, it's easier to minister to drug addicts than wealthy people. Santa Cruz is full of drug addicts and hippies. And that was tough ground. But at least they know they're a mess. People that have a ton of money and, and you know, people that are Jewish or think they've already got God, they, I don't need God, I'm good. But you know what? We're here for a reason. We're going to stay. Amen. Amen? And if you haven't noticed, on Sundays, church is growing and people are getting saved. Amen? So we, we stay faithful there. But it's easy when, when things are difficult to leave. And some people do. Well, that's not growing fast enough. I'm out of here. Same thing happened in Santa Cruz. We've been in Santa Cruz like nine months. Our first Sunday, we had 300 people. It was all the well-wishers from Calvary San Jose. Church of 3,000. A bunch of people came over. The next week, we had 12. After nine months, we had about 30. And people were like, it ain't going to happen, man. I'm going to go back to San Jose. Go ahead. Are you coming? I'm not going anywhere. If it's me and my wife and my kids, we're staying. I'm not going anywhere. And I don't want any of you to leave, but if you all do, I'm not going anywhere. Because when we're called to do something, we need to stay by the stuff even if everyone else leaves. Can we say amen to that? 22,000 left. Praise God for the 10,000 who stayed. I don't know if it was what pressure it was, but 10,000 stayed. Now, it's 13 and a half to one. Okay, God, that's amazing. All right. Well, Lord, okay, I better put out another fleece or something. I'm not sure this is right. Gideon is still being stirred up. God's testing his faith. All who were afraid went home. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and a sound mind. You know what? It's been said that Christians are either overcome because of their unbelief or overcomers because of their faith. Are you overcome or are you an overcomer? Are you overcome by your unbelief? Or are you an overcomer because of your faith? God is greater than anything I face. And Vance Havner said this, because Moses was a man of faith, he was able to see the invisible, choose the imperishable, and do the impossible. May we be men and women of faith. Amen? Hebrews 11, we see God saw faith. I don't have time to read it. I was going to read verses 30 to 38. But it talks about them being sawn in two and tortured. And, not, and it said the word wasn't even worthy of them. May we be men and women of faith. Amen? And I get phone calls, and, and it's okay. I want you to call me, and, and, and not just from here, even people from the radio, and just overwhelmed, and I get it. But guys, it's when we get our eyes off of the Lord that we get overwhelmed. Is our God greater than any circumstance? Was he greater than Jericho? Is he going to be greater than 135,000 trained military men? You better believe it. And so we're going to see that happen here. So while faith doesn't depend on how we feel or what we see, or what may happen, it will be reflected in our actions. Faith is not a feeling, it's a choice. I trust God. Amen? I trust Him. Do you feel, are you struggling? Yeah, I'm struggling with my feelings a little bit. I don't care, I trust God. Amen? Do your feelings ever lie to you? Do what you feel. Psycho babble nonsense. If I did what I feel, felt all the time, I'd be a mess. How about you? Amen? When I was a youth pastor, I used to say faith is like a toothbrush. Everybody should have one and use it regularly, but it isn't safe to use someone else's. <laughs> Amen? Everybody should have one and use it regularly, but don't trust in someone else's faith. May you live and have your own faith and your own walk with the Lord. Amen? And here's Gideon. And they're down to 10,000. And the te tests reveal the depths of our faith. It strengthens, strengthens us for coming tasks, tasks and difficulties. Isn't it true when you've been through one trial that you're more ready for the next one? Amen? And men and women of faith are people that have gone through great trials and seen God show up. And Gideon's about to go through a big one. So the valley is testing for both Gideon and his 32,000 men and one, this once cowardice, fearful, uh, needy, 
um, needing numerous miracles before he would move, now watches as 22,000 men get up and leave. His faith and 10,000 remaining men are being tested, but just when they must have thought they couldn't get any worse, hold on to your hat. You ever felt that way before? Oh, it can't get any worse than this. And then it does. Really? My wife's not here, I'll tell this. I was in the hospital nine months, in and out, in a coma. We got wiped out financially. And the day I came home, for the last time to stay home, I had to sleep near the fireplace in the living room because I was freezing. I weighed 128 pounds when I came home. I weigh 240 right now, so take 112 pounds off me. I had to be helped to walk. And the day I got home, I was laying by the fireplace. I'd been home a half an hour, and the police showed up to arrest one of my sons and take him to jail. And we didn't have any clue that it was coming. I remember my wife falling to her knees, and she said, okay, God, how much more? Have you ever felt that way? How much more? And again, we have faith in God, and God brought us through it. But there's moments where we feel like that. Amen? How much more? How, how, much, more can I, how much more can we possibly take? But it's at those moments that we're desperate, amen? And we're seeking the Lord. So it says there in verse four, but the Lord said to Gideon, the people are still too many. Lord help, really? You got $5 left in your bank account to feed your family for a month, that's too much. You're in a place of desperation and God tells you it's still too much. And he says to them, you're still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. Then it will be that of whom I say, this one shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And whoever I say to you, this one shall not go with you, he shall not go. So they're thinking, how much more can we take? You and I might feel the same way, seemingly one trial and difficulty on top of another. Lord, how much more can I handle? And then the Lord says, you need to trust me, and I'm going to remove even more. Because I'm going to bring you to a place where you stay desperate for me. Do you know it's just as easy for God to wipe out a million dollars of debt as it is to wipe out a dollar? That it's just as easy for God to cure cancer as it is to cure a common cold? Do you know that no obstacle is too great for God? So when we look at obstacles, they're only great if our God is small. I don't serve a small God, how about you? The obstacles aren't great because our God is greater. So not the greatness of the obstacle, but the greatness of our God. And watch what happens now. So this one shall go with you, this one will not. I will test them. The word test, word is used for refining metals when they separate the dross from pure ore. I remember we went on a field trip one time, we watched them do this, and they pour metal in, and then all the dross or the impure metals, you know, rise to the top, and they just scrape it all off, and then they, you know, they do it again, and then the gold or the whatever, silver, whatever, it gets purer and purer as they wipe away all the dross. That's what's being used here. He's saying, look, I'm purifying who's staying and I'm removing the dross. I'm removing those who've signed up that don't want to show up. I'm removing those who aren't going to go out by faith. And I'm going to leave the faithful ones here. So how's he going to do it? Verse 5. So he brought the people down to the water. And the Lord said, Everyone who laps from the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set apart by himself. Likewise, everyone who gets down on his knees to drink. And the number of those who lapped putting their hand to their mouth was 300 men, but all the rest of the people got down on their knees to drink water. So 9,700 of them got down to the water and literally just put their face in the water. It is the Middle East, it's probably hot, and they're like getting a drink, so they just put their whole face in the water and start drinking it. But 300 of the men bent down, grabbed the water, and drank it out of their hand. So 9,700 are on this side, and 300 are on this side. I wonder which side God's going to pick to stay. You can almost imagine Gideon going, well, we only lost 300. That's not too bad. All right. Well, not so much. Look what happens. Verse 7. The Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men who lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, every man to his own place. There's many different thoughts about why God picked the men who put their hands in the water. We don't know for sure. 
Could be he just divided them that way. Some believe it's because the men who grabbed the water were ready for battle because as they were drinking water, they were prepared looking around to see if any enemies were showing up. And the other guys were just face first in the water, sitting ducks for the enemy. Others have said that the 300 who did that were so old and decrepit and falling apart they couldn't bend all the way down, so they had to pick the water up, and God gave them the 300 most worthless people in the group. I don't know that that's the case. Uh, actually, I probably think it's closer to the first group, but however he chose them, God used them. And, you know, it's interesting, though, that kind of plays into the holy of water. You know, if you read in Matthew, it says, Watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. The spirit indeed willing, but the flesh is weak. In regards to the second coming, it says, But on that day, the hour no man know, know not the angels in heaven, nor uh, the Son, nor the Father. Take ye heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. That means take heed. It all says in 1 Peter, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. Be ready. Be looking around. Guys, be, you know, guys, we miss divine appointments all day long because we're so focused on something else that the opportunities are going right by us. Can we say amen to that? Amen. We have opportunities. When you pray for opportunities, when you pray for divine appointments, when, when I'm praying for my customers by name on the way to go see them for an opportunity to share Jesus, you know what? I get to share Jesus pretty much 100% of the time. Because when you pray for divine appointments, you don't miss them. But when you're so focused on, you know, I'm thirsty, face in the water. You know, when I'm so focused on something else, I'm missing out. Be vigilant. Be sober. So they're down to 300 guys. Took away so many resources, they could no longer trust in themselves. They're now small enough to be used by God. We need to come to the place where we're small enough to be used by God. Verse 8. So the people took provisions and their trumpets in their hands, and he sent them away, sent away all the rest of Israel, every man to his tent, and retained the 300 men. By the way, I got 300 guys, and they're bringing trumpets. I'm thinking if I'm getting into a battle, musical instruments, probably not what I'm bringing. But God has commanded him to bring trumpets. Don't say they're bringing swords. Doesn't say they're bringing, you know, spears. God calls them. So not only are they outnumbered, but from the world's perspective, they're outskilled. And it doesn't look like they have any way to, to match up the enemy they're about to face. And what that's going to do is make them desperate for God. It is interesting, interesting that they have trumpets, because what did they blow when they were marching around Judah? Trumpets. And here we are again. Probably a shofar. So they're small enough to be used by God. Now they're outnumbered. It went from 4 to 1 to 13 and a half to 1 to 450 to 1. Every guy's got to kill 450 people. To be, if I die and 450 people die, we're even. That's the number. And they're stepping out in faith. God giving Gideon a faith lesson. So first point, God tests our faith, takes away the resources needed to trust in ourselves. God encourages our faith. Look at verse, second part of verse 8. Now the camp of Midian was below him in the valley. So the camp of Midian, they're looking down. The position of the two armies will be very significant in the coming verses. They're looking down upon this massive army of 100, 135,000. I've been to the Colosseum during Promise Keepers. You guys remember Promise Keepers way back when? I was at the Coliseum, and there were about 100,000 guys there. It was pretty awesome, because it was all the seats were pretty much full, so was the whole infield. And when 100,000 guys are worshiping, that's pretty awesome. But there's more people than that. I remember being overwhelmed by how many people that was. 135,000, and I got 299, I got 300 friends. And I'm looking at something, you know, the Coliseum and a half full of people against 300 guys. And, you, and, and God's making sure they know it because they're standing up above them and they can see very clearly how many guys they've got. And there they are in this position. The camp of Midian was below him in the valley. Verse 9. It happened on the same night that the Lord said to him, Arise and go down against the camp, for I've delivered it into your hand. Isn't it good to know when God tells you the battle belongs to you, you win. 
Victory's coming. You're not fighting for victory, you're fighting from victory. Now go. It's one thing to hear, yay God, praise the Lord. We're gonna win, now go. Um, it's 300 against 135. You gonna strike them with lightning first or something? Can we get a little earthquake going here, Lord? Um, and notice God doesn't tell him how he's gonna bring him to victory, he just tells him that he is. And God doesn't always tell us how he's gonna bring about the restoration, amen? We don't even know. But we have to learn to trust God. It's not believing, seeing and then believing, it's believing and then seeing. God had already told Gideon three times that he would give Israel victory. And here he tells them again. He reassured him three times by giving him special signs. The fire from the rock, the wet fleece, the dry fleece surrounded by wet ground should have been strong in his faith, responded in obedience. But Gideon was afraid to seize God's promises. After, his, after all, he's outnumbered. Look at verse 10. But if you're afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Purah, your servant, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. Then he went down with Purah, his servant, to the outposts of the armed men who were in the camp. So he's fearful, and God says, look, you can trust me, but if you're afraid, go ahead and go down with Purah, and just go down there and go outside the camp and just listen to what's going on down there. Now again, the greatest amount of faith would be, Lord, you've already told me, I'll just go. But sometimes don't we need to be encouraged? And that's what's gonna happen. They're gonna go down seeking answers from the Lord. By the way, isn't that one of the reasons we need fellowship so much, so we can be encouraged and strengthened and, and refreshed and go back out and live amongst the lost and a dying world? Can you say amen to that? When I come in here, I feel like, you know, I feel like I'm coming in, I'm just getting refreshed. How about you? I'm getting filled up again, and I'm ready to go back out right? Calvary Chapel Santa Cruz, we had signs at every door when you walked out. It says, you are now entering your mission field. As soon as you walk out that door, you're entering your mission field. Maybe we should do that with one of the extra signs that we're not using. But yeah, we would put it by the door so people would walk out. Just as a reminder, by the way, you didn't come here just to get filled up. You came here to get filled up so you can go out and, and pour out. Amen? So, Verse 12, now the Midianites and the Amalekites, by the way, they should have all been dead by now. God had told them to wipe them all out. They didn't, so now they're coming back to haunt them, and now they're ruling over them. And it says, and the people of the east were lying in the valley as numerous as locusts, and their camels were without number as the sand was by the seashore in the multitude. So camels, again, they're big, they're strong, they're quick. You're on your feet, people running by on camels. You're outnumbered, they've got armor, you don't. They've got 450 guys to every guy you have. You come down and now you're seeing the obstacle up close and personal. And it would be easy just to be so overwhelmed to doubt God, question God, run from God. By the way, the enemy wants you to be out of fellowship when you're struggling. Can you say amen to that? You know when you need to be here the most, you should be here always. You always should be in fellowship. That's the word of God says. For saying not together yourselves together and all the more as the day approaches. But when we need it the most is when we're struggling the most. Can we say amen to that? That's why we need to be in the Word and be surrounded by encouragement. Now here comes the divine appointment. Watch what happens. And when Gideon had come, there was a man telling a dream to his companion. So out of 135,000 men, they happen to go up and they're on the outskirts and they're listening to a conversation between two of the 135,000. And look what happens. I love this. It says here, to, it says, uh, I, I had a dream, and to my surprise, a loaf of barley bread, barley bread was only eaten by the poorest of people, tumbled into the camp of Midian. It came to a tent and struck it so that it fell and overturned, and the tent collapsed. Now watch his companion's interpretation from an ungodly man. Then his companion answered and said, this is nothing else but the sword of Gideon. Gideon sitting there with one other guy looking at 135,000 guys, and he hears two guys talking, and one of them mentions by name that it's the sword of Gideon that's gonna come down upon us. The guy prophesies. Isn't it amazing that sometimes God will use the world to speak truth to you? To exhort you when they don't even know they're doing it? God used the Midianites as righteous judgment upon his old people. Do you think it's by chance he happened to hear that conversation? You think God put him in his path for a reason. Tomorrow when you go out, when you interact with people, none of it's by chance. It's all by divine appointment, amen? Last night my wife and I and two of my boys, we got an invite from KDAR, the radio station we're on, 
for a premiere of a new Christian movie. It was, it's called uh, The Broken Road. God Loves a Broken Road. Yeah, and so we saw it yesterday. And what was interesting, though, you know, I'm in Oxnard, and I'm walking through the movie theater, and when I went up to get my tickets, I had to tell the guy my name, and as soon as I said my name, four or five people around said, oh, you're on the radio, and they started talking to me about the Lord, and I ended up talking to this one guy about the Lord for like half an hour, and all I did was show up for a movie, and I wasn't even like looking for people to witness to. Amen? Uh, I need your name, sir, for the tickets, or Dave Johnston. Wait a minute, you're on the, yeah, praise the Lord, yeah, you know, God will bring divine appointments if you just pray for them, amen, you'll be at, in the grocery store, or you'll be, you know, being at the, at the gas station, it's amazing the divine appointments come your way if you just pray for them, amen, and sometimes when you're not even thinking about it and you're being thick, God will just put them right in front of you, amen. And so here it is, they're down there, and God is encouraging him from the words of these two men that don't even know that Gideon's listening. They're an answer to prayer, and he don't even know it. Now, is Gideon going to go back with a little more faith now? What's the answer? Yes. God helps those who are weak in faith. He's encouraged. Is he encouraging his faith? He could have said by now, Gideon, you faithless worm. How many more things I got to show you? Couldn't you have done that? You did the fleece thing. I already told you I was giving you victory. You made me put water on a fleece. And then you said, we'll put the water everywhere but the fleece. You worthless little worm, get down the hill. God could have done that, right? And what does he do instead? The same thing he does with us. We're thick. He puts his arm around us. Amen? Dave, I still love you. Dave, I know you're overwhelmed by this, but I'm in control and it's okay. Amen? How many of you guys need that sometimes? I'm telling you, when I got off the 10 freeway and my son was at that exit, I'm going down to find my son in the midst of 10 million people and I drive right to my, tell me that's not a God thing. My son about fell out of his, he almost fell out of his skin when he looked up and there's his dad at three o'clock in the morning on the off ramp off the 10 freeway in South Central Los Angeles. I pull up, hey, <laughs> get in the car. <laughs> But God has a way of doing the supernatural to encourage those who follow him. God loves to increase our faith. And God will give us opportunities to grow in our faith. And it says there in verse 15, it says God, it says God, it says the son of Joash, the man of Israel, verse 14, into his hand God has delivered Midian and the whole camp. And so it was, when Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, that he what? That's the response we should always have when God speaks to us. Can we say amen to that? When I was crying out looking for my son and he got in the car, I'm driving on the freeway with my son and I'm worshiping the Lord and I have tears running down my face and it impacted my son because he'd never seen me so emotional in my life. I was so thankful to God because I was so worried that the next time I was going to see him was God was going to be doing his funeral. And you know what? There, when we come to that place of desperation, God speaks to us. Amen? And, and you know what? Being desperate's okay. We don't ever want to be desperate. We don't want to be uncomfortable. We don't want to go through trials. But praise God in the midst of them. Final point. God honors and blesses our faith. Look what happens in verse 15b. It says, Arise. He returned to the camp of Israel and said, Arise, for the Lord has delivered the camp of Midian into your hand. What happened to him? Does he have greater faith now? What's the answer? Yes. Where before he had, you know, he's always questioning, he's always doubting, now he's finally heard it, and now he comes back with boldness, says, Guys, man up, we're going to win. He could have already known that. God had already told him before. But sometimes it takes the Lord speaking to us repeatedly or us going through great difficulty or us seeing the hand of God over and over where we finally get to the place where we say, okay, God, I trust you to the point where I'm going to tell everybody else. And Gideon goes beyond being a man who doubts to a man who shares with others with great boldness. And that's how you know when someone's walking in faith, they don't just keep it to themselves. They're not afraid. They're not ashamed of their faith. They're willing to step out in faith. They're willing to speak with boldness. They're willing to minister to the lives of others, verse 16 to 18. And then it says there, then he divided the 300 men into three companies, and he put a trumpet in every man's hand. Again, if God didn't tell you to do this, who would ever do this? 
There's 135,000 guys down there with shields and armor and camels. Let's get some trumpets. I think we should start a band. And then he gave him a pitcher in the other hand. Are there any swords in any hands? Trumpet in this hand, pitcher in this hand. You've got to be kidding me right now. Let's go. Let's go fight 135,000 armed soldiers. Yes, Lord. That takes faith. Amen? Stepping out. I love this picture, though. Next time the Lord asks you to do something, say, well, at least I didn't have to fight 135,000 men with a trumpet and a pitcher in my hand. Within each of the pitchers, look what it says here in verse uh, 16. It says, every pitcher's torches inside. So you had a pitcher. It's like a clay pot. And inside of it, they put a, a, like a, you know, a fire, something on fire. And they put that in there, and they're carrying that, the spire in one hand, and a trumpet in the other, and they're going down the hill toward 135,000 men, not even fully understanding what they're going to do when they get there. And he puts them in three groups of 100 men coming from three different directions down upon 135,000 guys. So they're going to see them coming down the hill eventually. Right now they're coming in the night. Now watch what happens. He said to them, look at me and do likewise. Watch, and when I come to the edge of the camp, you shall do as I do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then, then you also blow the trumpets on every side of the whole camp, and, and say, the sword of, sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now, usually when someone blew a trumpet, they were leading an, a, a, a huge number of soldiers, as many as 10,000. So when they hear 300 trumpets, all blowing, or like shofars, all blowing at the same time, the assumption is going to be, in the minds of some of these men, 300 times 10,000. Oh my goodness, we're in trouble. There's 300,000 soldiers coming down that hill at us right now. Guys, if God is for me, who can be against me? Amen? You know, one will chase 10 and two will put 1,000 to flight. And so they're coming down this hill and he's telling them, when I blow my trumpet and all my guys blow theirs, then all of you blow your trumpets as well. But then notice what else he says. You know, and then they're going to shout, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Now, that man who had that dream and talked about Gideon coming, do you think he kept that to himself? Think he might have shared it with a few other people? You think the people that are sitting there have all heard it? So they're already worried about Gideon coming. They've already heard about the dream that he's coming. And now they're going to see hear 300 trumpets that to their minds could be 300,000 soldiers. And now they're going to hear them shouting, the sword of Gideon. And they're going to get petrified. They're going to be afraid. Because again, you plus God is a majority. But notice what else they do. So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outpost of the camp, the beginning of the middle watch. It's about three in the morning. And just as they had posted the watch, and they blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers that were in the hands, then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands, and the trumpets in their right hands for blowing, and they cried, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So here's what they saw coming. A bright, li bright light's coming down the hill. They hear 300 trumpets blowing. They hear the shouting. They hear comes, you know, the tribe of the sword of Gideon. They're coming down to attack. And when they look up, they think what they see is 300,000 people coming. It is interesting that the light didn't shine until the pot was broken. Amen? And guys, the only way we're going to shine brightly before the Lord is when we're broken. Amen? You've heard me say it many times, the only thing that becomes more valuable when broken is a man or a woman. Everything else that breaks, you know, we put it on the curb or we sell it at garage sale for a quarter, right? But when we're broken, we become more valuable, more usable. The light of the Lord shines through us when we're broken, when we're at the end of ourselves, when we're desperate for God. When I was looking for my son, I, I went on Facebook and told everybody I knew to be praying as I went looking for him. And I had people responding to me from all over California. I had people ready to get in cars and come help me. And I didn't care if the whole world knew what I was going through because I wanted everybody praying. And you know, when you're desperate for God, you cease to be, you know, walking around. Because there's a lot of Christians. Everything in my life is perfect. 
Isn't that true? My family's perfect. They all walk around the house just singing praise songs all day long. Me and my wife have never had an argument. We just wash each other's feet every night, <laughs> sing praise songs. There's never a problem in my house. All my kids get straight A's. I have a perfect job. My house is amazing. We never have any problems. I'm, 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 I'm. Christian face. I was talking to somebody today, and he said, I'll never measure up to the word of God. I said, amen. Me either. Can we say amen to that? That's why we need a savior. Amen? And we need to be in a place where we can be transparent with each other. Amen? I'm transparent about the struggles I go through in my life because I want you to know that I'm just one beggar leading another beggar to the bread. Amen? And it's okay for you to share what you're, what you're going through so we can pray for you. Amen? If everybody walks around like their life is perfect, it's just not true. That's why we need our Savior. Amen? So they blow the trumpets. They break the pictures. They're in their hands. Here they come. Then the three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers. They held the torches in their left hands. The trumpets in their right hands were blowing. And they said, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And every man stood in his place all around the camp. And the whole army ran and cried out and fled. They're coming down the hill. They're standing there. They, they hear the trumpets blowing. They see the, the glow of the torches that are coming because torches would lead groups. You know, trumpets would lead groups. They hear it. And these guys... These 135,000 guys start running from 300 guys. They're afraid. And they start running away. Monty Python, keep running. And they're running away. And it says there, when the 300 blew the trumpets, the Lord set every man's sword against his companion throughout the whole camp. And the army fled to beth Achai and toward Zerubbah, Zerah as far as the border of Abel Mahala by Tabith. And the men of Israel gathered together at Naphtali and Asher and all Manasseh and pursued the Midianites. Here's what happens. When the trumpets blew and the men began to flee, they got confused and they started killing each other. Their enemies took their swords out. There's no way a man could have planned this. Only God could have done this. I want you to get down to 300 guys. I want you to have no weapons. I want you to come down holding a trumpet and a pitcher in your hand. And I'm gonna, they're going to be so scared to death, they're going to start killing each other. And God doesn't tell them that until they step out in faith first. And often, I think we're going to get to heaven and some of us find out what could have happened had we stepped out. And I'm always convicted by that. How about you? Lord, I want to be about it i got a vapor of time to serve you. Let's finish up. As we're looking at God honors and blesses our faith. Notice in verse 23 that once they started chasing them, all of a sudden some other people got brave. Isn't that amazing? Uh, anyone's afraid, go home. I'm going home. We're down to 300 guys. All of a sudden, ah, and they're all running away, and all of a sudden it says other tribes got up and ran out to help them. It reminds me when David fought Goliath. Remember, Goliath comes down the Valley of Elah. I defy the armies. Bring out, you know, and they're, all, and they're all shaking in their boots for 40 days. Nobody comes down. Number of testing. David comes down. I'll fight him. Who's this uncircumcised Philistine that comes against my God? Because when David showed up, the Holy Spirit entered the camp. David goes out, slays Goliath. All of a sudden, all the guys from Israel who are shaking in their boots start chasing all the Philistines. Because when one person steps up with boldness and faith, doesn't it increase the faith of others? May we be those people. Amen? Let's finish up here. And it says there, verse 24, Then Gideon sent messengers throughout all the mountains of Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and seize from them the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. And all the men of Ephraim gathered together and seized the watering places as far as Beth Barah and the Jordan. So here's what they did. All the guys were running away, so they just mounted up soldiers next to the places where they'd go to seek water. When they came, they killed them. They were going to need water eventually. And so... God, get, doesn't he give wisdom now to Gideon? God gives him wisdom. Now he's in the midst of the battle. He stepped out in faith. God gives him wisdom. God begins to use him. And then finally it says there, and they captured two princes from the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb. And they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb. Now it's interesting that they're killing one of the leaders of the Midianites at a winepress. And then we just, when we first saw Gideon, where was he? It was at a wine press. 
And he was afraid at a wine press. And he was in hiding at a wine press. And it was there that he was trying to get enough food in the wine press, a picture of the shed blood of our Savior. And, and now we see this man being put to death at a wine press. Has God come full circle in Gideon's life? Has God taken him from a man who was fearful and afraid to a man of faith who's being used mildly by God? God can do it in him, he can do it in us. Can we say amen to that? Yes. Absolutely can. And then it says there, and they pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side of the Jordan. You know, when I, when I ask for presents, that's just not on my list. Hey, Gideon, we got your present. Here you go. The head of the oppressors who were coming and stealing our food for seven years. The guys who enslaved us. How do we get out of that enslavement? We put our faith in the Lord and we step out in faith. Amen? So, the church today can learn a lot from this event and be encouraged by it. First of all, again, God doesn't need large numbers or especially gifted leaders to fulfill his purposes. They had low numbers and their leader was a guy that was pretty faithless at that point. Needed constant reminder and constant help to even step out. Gideon was the best they had and God did great things. God doesn't need big buildings or big budgets or big marketing programs. More can be done with a few desperate, eternally focused, sold out believers than an army filled with people who have no faith in God. 300 chased 135,000. Why? Because if God is for us, who can be against us? Amen? So, small enough to be used, for God to use. My prayer this whole week as I've been studying this, Lord, make me small enough for you to be used. Keep me humble, keep me desperate, keep me broken, do what's necessary. God tests our faith. Next time you want to shake your fist to God because he's testing your faith, remember that he's testing your faith because he loves you. Amen to that? That's how you grow. God encourages our faith that we might overcome fear. When we step out in faith, he's there to encourage us. And then finally, God honors and blesses our faith. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we love you, Lord. We thank you for the example of Gideon in your word. He's a man we can relate to because he's far from perfect. But Lord, we're thankful that as you encouraged him, he did eventually step out in faith. And Lord, he became a man who led others and a man who wasn't overwhelmed by the numbers anymore. He put his faith in you. And Lord, I pray for everybody here tonight. I don't know what all the details of everybody that's going through. I know some people in this room may be struggling financially, may be struggling with their health, maybe struggling with kids that are wayward or a, a marriage that's difficult, uh, maybe struggling with depression or fear. And Lord, I just pray you would meet all of us right where we are and give us the faith we need to trust you in the midst of our circumstances. Not to keep our eyes on the waves, but the, our eyes on the Lord. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said, Amen. let's stand and close the worship song.